Pastor, please unmute. Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at uh, what do we have authority over? Uh, what are the realms of authority that we have? Now, uh, we saw that we have authority over Satan, over uh, every demonic work, over every demonic oppression. Uh, we also saw that we have authority over the natural elements, uh, the circumstances, the situations that concerns us in the world, in our life, that's affecting our lives, like our job, our career, our family, our future. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and we saw that, you know, we can dominate uh, those situations, those circumstances, because we have authority over uh, those situations and those uh, circumstances, okay? But we were looking at one area that we cannot exercise our authority over, okay? And what is that area? That area is uh, of other people's will, okay? Um, that's a realm that we do not exercise our God-given authority in. Uh, we cannot control people as robots uh, or as machines. Uh, that's what witchcraft does, okay? Uh, but yes, we can affect people's environment. If something is, if something demonic is coming against them, then, you know, uh, you and I can step in. Um, uh, if there's something happening in the in their natural circumstances, uh, and if they are willing to allow us, then we can step in, we can intervene for them. Uh, we can, uh, you know, use our faith, our God-given authority and help them. But we cannot exercise authority or control, have control over their will. Okay, so that is one area that we do not, uh, you know, have access to and we cannot control people's will. Yes, we also share the gospel with them but we don't force them uh you know to receive jesus christ it's their will to choose okay we also share what god can do in their lives uh, but it's their will to choose whether they would allow us to pray to deliver them uh to set them free to pray for their sickness and uh, so that they can receive healing okay how do we uh, exercise our kingdom authority uh, you know, we already saw just one just before we went for our break. We saw that, you know, we need to, the words of our mouth, uh, you know, speak just like uh, we saw Jesus speak to the storm. Uh, we also see him speaking and casting out demons, asking them to leave, uh, speaking to sicknesses, diseases and infirmities. So we speak uh, words out of our mouth. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 4 says, where the word of the king is, there is power. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 4 says, where the word of the king is, there is power. So, uh, you know, when we speak God's words of authority, you know, that's where we're speaking the words of the king, what he's asked us to say, what he's taught us to say. When we speak that words with the authority that he's given us, uh, when we issue decrees um, in the that come out in the name of Jesus, and, uh, you know, we will see people being delivered, healed, restored, uh, receiving forgiveness of their sins, set free. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, in my name, you will cast out demons. So in his name, by his the authority of his name, when we heal the sick, when we speak to situations, when we speak to the storm, when we speak to circumstances, when we speak to demonic forces and strongholds in the name of Jesus, you know, uh, uh, things we will see, uh, you know, things happening in the natural because we're coming to the natural 
through the spiritual. We're coming to the natural through the spiritual, and uh, we're using um, what uh, the authority that God has given to us. We're doing it in the way that He's taught us to. He's asked us to in His name. Uh, you know, we are uh, uh, casting out demons in His authority of His name. You know, we are healing the sick, uh, uh, raising the dead, and casting out demons. So, as a believer, we have the we have been given uh, the authority, the right to use the name of Jesus. And when we use the name of Jesus, uh, we need to understand that it's not like a magical charm, you know, that uh, uh, we use. We don't keep saying the name of Jesus 100 times or, you know, we don't keep screaming it or shouting it or jumping, uh, saying the name of Jesus, uh, uh, thinking that something will happen. Uh, that's not how we use the name of Jesus. Uh, you know, the name of Jesus is using the fact that you have been delegated, uh, 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 you know, by him on his behalf. So using the name of Jesus actually means that you are there in his place, being his representative, uh, representing him on behalf of him. You know, you're doing um, what he's asked you to do. And even as you speak that name, uh, it's not just speaking a name like, you know, I can just call out any name in class like, uh, you know, Rosalind or Jeffina or uh, uh, John or, you know, uh, uh, Paul or Peter. But, you know, um, when we're using the name, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's basically we are thinking about, you know, uh, manifesting the glory of that name. It's manifesting who God is and what he does. So we're actually speaking that name that's manifesting the whole of his nature, all of his uh, demonstrations of his power, what he can uh, uh, do. So we need to be mindful of uh, the name that we are speaking, who uh, he is, uh, what um, is his nature, what is his attributes, and what he can uh, do. For example, you know, uh, if a chief minister tells his personal assistant, you know, go and tell so-and-so that I told them uh, uh, to do this job, and if the personal assistant, you know, goes to that person and says, the chief minister asked me to tell you that he wants you to do this, 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 now the job is done, no questions asked, okay, the job is just done. So similarly, you know, the king of glory, uh, the king of all kings, uh, the most high God, you know, has sent you and me uh, with his name on our lives and uh, he's given us his authority and we've been authorized by the king, uh, by King Jesus to get that work done in his name. And uh, when we speak that most powerful name, that mighty name, you know, uh, things are... Uh, done the work is done and we need to believe that we need to believe that in faith that uh what we are asking uh, that we will see that in the natural uh, for example when uh, peter's mother-in-law when she was sick with fever uh when jesus was standing next to her uh, we read this in luke chapter 4 uh the you know the bible says and jesus rebuked the fever and the fever left her. he didn't say he didn't pray to the father about the fever but he just spoke to the fever and it uh, left her, okay? So when we, you know, when you and I exercise authority, when you speak to that condition, you speak to that disease in the name of Jesus, we need to believe that it will leave them, that it has already left them. You know, um, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, um, it says Jesus cast out spirits by his word. Okay, by his words, he cast out spirits. So you when, you, when you and I speak to that demonic works and those demonic spirits in Jesus' name, they have to leave. Okay, and we also saw the example when Jesus spoke to the storm. You know, he did not get up and say, Father, what is your will in the storm? What do I do? Uh, he already knew the will of the Father. And what he does, he just spoke to the winds and the waves. And, um, you know, that is a way we use our uh, authority. Sometimes, you know, we are waiting for God to speak to us, uh, waiting for God to uh, tell us what to do. And sometimes, you know, God does not speak. There's silence because uh, he's, you know, it just goes, signifies to tell us that, you know, 
uh, he's already told us what to do in that situation and we just have to go ahead and and do it there's nothing new that he has to say so he's not speaking and you know what we need to do is we need to speak to that sickness disease and whatever situations that we are uh, going through another way we exercise our authority the first one is to speak uh, words through our mouth the second one in the name of jesus the second one is we exercise authority by the holy spirit um the anointing of the holy spirit upon us empowers us to overthrow every work of darkness uh, we know that scripture says it's the anointing that breaks yokes and it uh, uh, moves or removes burdens so that is why you and I need to pray and ask God for more of his anointing of his spirit uh, in our lives uh, for every day for a fresh new anointing of, um, of the spirit in our lives. Um, you know, we could uh, we can choose to be either one of these two. We can choose to be a wire, you know, a wire that conducts only 1.5 amps of uh, uh, of small amount of power that uh, runs in it or we can be a high tension wire that conducts uh, kilovolts of power running through it so you can choose to be the one you can choose to be a uh, just a wire which conducts 1.5 amps of small amount of power or we can be that high tension wire that conducts kilovolts of power now the choice is ours but you know the power source uh, is unlimited supply okay whichever wire you are the power source is unlimited supply but how much you want to draw out from that unlimited supply what kind of wire what kind of conductor you want to be uh, in your spirit that is a choice that you know each one of is is left to each one of us so if we are desiring for more of an anointing for more of a breakthrough uh, we receive that from the unlimited supply that is uh, in in us because it says you know, jesus had the anointing without measure you know and uh, we know that you know god the father is not a partial god and he is he's also given us uh, you know uh, the spirit without measure and so it's in the extent that we tap into it and want to draw out of it uh, depend, uh, depends on us, depends on what kind of wires that we are going to be, what kind of anointing that we carry in our uh, lives. The Bible says that we have been strengthened by power in our spirit, uh, man. So we pursue God for a greater anointing of the Holy Spirit and let's pursue God for a greater move of the uh, spirit. We may not be seeing cancers healed or lame people walk, the dead being raised, uh, but you know, we know that is what God has called us to. And because He's called us to do all of these things, uh, you know, we need to cry out to God and tell Him that we are hungry, we desire. Uh, uh, to see the uh, you know the the dead raised the the sick healed you know the blind see the the deaf to hear the mute to speak the lame to walk and uh, like the early church so when we desire you know uh, God is willing to release that same anointing and then we can see uh, cancers healed and. Um, uh, people, uh, you know, um, the lame walk. I, I like what uh, Bill Johnson says, you know, he, he says he prayed for two or three people with uh, the same uh, 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 disease or sickness and he never saw them healed. And at one point, you know, uh, he saw a, a mother who brought uh, a child with that same sickness and uh, she had all these hopes that, you know, that, that her child will be healed. But when the child was not healed, you know, she's, he could see the heaviness in her face and in her heart. And, uh, you know, he said that uh, it did not lead him to think that this is not an area of uh, sickness or disease that God has called him to heal. No, he says, you know, what? what I did was I went into the uh, secret place and I I just kept, uh, you know, pursuing in prayer and I kept asking God, what did I not do right? What should I do right next time to see people in this condition uh, being healed? And so I think, you know, uh, that is what each one of us need to do. 
uh, when we pray for cancer people and they're not healed, cancer patients, um, you know, they're not healed. It does not mean that God has not called us to minister to that kind of uh, terrain or that dominion or uh, domain of people. But, you know, we need to go and say, God, what did I not do right? What do I have to do next time? Show me, lead me, uh, because you want these people to be healed. Uh, you know, this is your uh, calling upon my life. This is what you have asked me to do. You said I can do greater things. And how can I do these greater things? Things. So, you know, greater pursuing for God or for things that, um, uh, you know, we want to see so that people can experience the manifest glory of God. So let's press in for more of the anointing. Um, this is how the world uh, will know that the, the message that we are preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God is uh, true. Again, okay? the third way we exercise our kingdom authority is through prayer. Uh, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Uh, you know, we need to pray the kingdom of God into our situations. We need to pray the, we need to pray the kingdom of God into our problems. Uh, you know, so let's arise. It's time for us to rise up. You know, uh, if we have been, uh, if we have been ignorant about our position, what God has given to us, we know it now. You've heard it now. You have no excuse. Uh, if some of us have already known it, but we've been timid, you know, we've not been given a spirit of timidity or of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen to that. And uh, we need to operate in the kingdom authority. If some, some of us are sleeping, just happy, comfortable, complacent about what we have received, then it's time for us to, you know, to arise um, and think kingdom authority think kingdom dominion um, you know god has gone through the extreme length uh, to place us in an authority uh, which was not bought very easily you know god had to give up his only son forsake his only son jesus who was sinless without sin had to take upon our sins the sins of the old world upon himself he had to die such a painful death uh, went through shame misery pain uh, face death uh, so that you know we can be brought to this place of authority so that we can be placed brought to this space of um, position and like we saw you know in the kingdom parables we studied uh, last week you know if we are not good stewards of the uh, of the of what God has entrusted to us he will you know we will forfeit it we will be taken away it will be given to those uh, who have uh, you know who have multiplied who made it more uh, we saw that in the last parable okay and so you know God has given us this authority um, you know if you're not going to use it then you know what's going to happen so uh, you know if it wasn't for the cross you and I will not have this authority and we see that God going to such an extent so that uh, we can be raised, so that we can be seated with him in heavenly places, not just to enjoy the position, but so that we can bring his kingdom here on earth. Okay, so that is the kingdom authority. That is the uh, kingdom domain that he's given, dominion he's given to us. Uh, so let's rise up. And, uh, you know, um, even as we've listened to this lesson, you know, it's just more than a lesson. It's something so powerful. Uh, you know, I hope it's woken us up and shaken us up and, uh, you know, uh, spoken to us this morning. And even as it has, I hope, you know, each one of us will rise up to the place that God has called us to. Uh, to position ourselves so that we can use his authority and to bring his kingdom here on earth. Okay, any questions anyone has? Are all of you with me? Yes? No? Okay. Okay. Any questions? No questions? I hope you've been able to take in everything that this lesson has. It's just so powerful. Uh, just soak in it, uh, you know, and just uh, rise up to who you are in Christ. Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, then let's move on 
to chapter 9, Kingdom Government. Okay. Oh, we saw in uh, chapter 1, and we, uh, we also specifically dwelt, dealt in chapter 2, that God is king. Okay, and because he has his king, he has a kingdom, and hence he has uh, a rule, uh, you know, uh, because he has a kingdom, he has to rule, he reigns, and he has to exercise his authority, and that is done through his government. Okay, uh, in Psalm chapter 22, verse 8, can somebody read that please? Psalm chapter 22, verse 28. Psalm 22, verse 28. Can one of you please read that? So the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over uh, the nations. Okay, before we proceed, I just wanted to say that, you know, if you know that, uh, if you've noticed, you know, I've not just been following the notes, I've just been giving you a lot of extra information. So I hope you all are uh, looking at your notes and also taking down uh, some points uh, that will help you. You can actually use this... Uh, you know, as a whole sermon series that you can preach in your own churches or in your uh, um, in your Bible study, uh, because it's just so powerful. It just reminds people about uh, uh, who God is, what He's called us to, and where He's positioned us. Okay, so Psalm chapter twenty-two, verse twenty-eight says, "The kingdom is the Lord, and He rules over the nations." So even today, God is a ruler over the nations of the earth. Psalm hundred and three, verse nineteen. Can one of you read that, please? Psalm hundred and three, verse nineteen. Psalm 103. Psalm chapter 103, verse 19. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Thank you, Jafina. So we see that his kingdom in our present fallen world rules over everything. So we have to recognize God's rule uh, coming through our world today. Okay, wherever we are, wherever God has placed us, um, um, or wherever we live today, you know, his rule is coming through to you in your life. Okay, God's rule is coming uh, through us, uh, into our life, into our situations, into our circumstances, uh, the geographical area that we are um, living in. So God has placed authority structures around us, and he has placed us in those authority structures. Uh, now we are living in a fallen world, uh, but you know God's government comes to us through the authority structures that he has placed in our lives. We will look at the various authority structures in a, in a little bit. Okay. Now we are in some way, in one way or in, or more, uh, you know, uh, part of these authority structures that God has placed in our life. It can be authority structure in the family, uh, church, in our local church, citywide church. It can be uh, authority. Authority structure, more of these authority structures that God has placed in our lives. Um, and in some of these authority structures that God has placed in our lives, we can be in place of position in those authority structures. For example, um, you know, being a husband, you are the uh, authority in the home and in, in the family. Uh, or if you are a pastor, you are an authority structure in the local church. Or if you are an apostle, you are 
an authority structure in the uh, the uh, you know um, uh, the body of Christ, or if you're um, you know uh, a manager or a CEO or uh, you know uh, you own you the uh, you own a business, then you're the authority uh, uh, in the at the workplace. Okay, so we have authority. Uh, we have we have God has placed us in positions of authority in the authority structures, and through these uh, positions that. So we have, uh, you know, God's government is being released into our world. Okay, so we, you're not just the husband uh, uh, in the home, uh, but you know, you are an authority structure that uh, that God has uh, uh, placed in the home to bring about God's government, to bring about God's reign, rule, His presence, uh, His uh, His uh, His work, His uh, His power to be manifested in and through you. That's what it means. So even as you are a teacher in a school, you know. God has placed you and he's uh, looking for you to release his government, his kingdom authority, reign, uh, kingdom values, kingdom uh, presence, kingdom uh, power uh, uh, in the school, in the classroom that you are teaching. Uh, uh, you're living in a specific um, a neighborhood, uh, then, you know, God has placed you in that place uh, to release his uh, his uh, his government in that uh, in that in your locality in your neighborhood in the city uh, if you're pastor of a church then you know god is releasing his government in and through you to bring about his uh, rule reign uh, you know his kingdom presence his kingdom power uh, it, it, through you to shepherd the flock that uh, uh, you are uh, overseer of or God has entrusted to you. So generally uh, for mankind, uh, this is how we view God's authority structure lived out. Uh, for mankind, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 and verses 11 and verse 12. So can somebody please read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse uh, 3 and verse 11 and 12, please. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Nevertheless, Neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also come to woman. But all things are from God. Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. So it's very interesting because in verse 3, you know, he's describing uh, the authority structure. Paul is describing the authority structure in verse 3. He says the head of woman is man. And the head of man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, now where does he say that the head of Christ is God? Uh, we know that Christ, uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all equal. Uh, they are one, uh, they are all co-equal. So Christ, we know, is co-equal with God. Uh, there is no difference in, in God the Father, God the Son. But when it comes to the release of the government of God, uh, you know, he says that the head of Christ is God. So when it comes to the release of the government of God, he says the head of Christ is God. And we see that Christ himself submitted himself to the Father's will and carried it out on the earth. And he said in the same way, the head of a woman is man, uh, which means that man is not superior to the woman because he says in, um, in verse um, uh, 12, he says that a woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. So here we see that they are dependent on each other. Uh, okay, man is dependent on woman, woman is dependent on man. And in the eyes of God, you know, both of them are co-equal, they're equal in uh, God's eyes. 
uh, but when it comes to God's government, just like it comes to God's government in Christ, you know, um, God is uh, head over Christ, okay? And so also when it comes to God's government, the head of a woman is man. Now, understanding this government of God is so important because until we learn to correctly relate to God's authority structure, you know, we will not have God's blessing flowing into our lives. So we must learn to understand God's authority structure. We must learn to understand uh, God's government flowing through his authority structure. Uh, when we learn to relate to it correctly uh, uh, in it, when we learn to relate to it correctly in it and towards it, uh, then we position ourselves to receive the blessings that God in in intended uh, through it. Okay. Now, God has authority structures for all of us. Um, in the family, God has his authority structure, uh, his government in the family, uh, you know, through which he exercises his influence. For the local church, you know, God has an authority structure. He has his govern government uh, through the local church, through which he exercises in his influence. Same way in the uh, body of Christ, same way in the workplace, same way in the, the civil government. You know, God has authority structures and through his government, he exercises his influence in all of these realms, in all of these spheres. Now, in all of these areas, we must learn to see the kingdom of God coming through uh, these authority structures that you and I are part of. Uh, we just don't look at them as structures that, you know, sometimes we want to just break free from, uh, rebel against, tear down, you know, but uh, well, that's a wrong posture to have. Sometimes uh, we want to just, uh, you know, break free from a, a church, a, a local church, or, you know, uh, the workplace. Uh, uh, we want to rebel. Uh, we want to tear it down. But that's the wrong posture to have. We must learn to relate to all of these government um, authority structures that God has placed in our life. We need to relate to it correctly because God uh, intends to release his influence, his blessing uh, through them into our lives. Okay, so let's look at uh, each one of them one by one uh, for the family. Okay, first we look at God's authority structure in the family. Uh, for the family, God says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. All of you are following with me. Am I too fast? Am I too fast? Okay, Rosalind, you have, have you have your hand up? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, if you can explain again uh, the last uh, sentence in that uh, uh, paragraph, like yet in God's authority structure, man is to be the leader and the channel through which the government of God flows. Yes, um, that's what we're coming uh, to now. We're just looking at it now. Uh, so when after we read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, I'll explain that. Is that okay, Rosalind? Um, okay, ma'am. Oh, and then if I still did not answer your question, then you can ask me towards the end of the class. Okay, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Okay, so please, can somebody read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, please? Somebody? Ephesians 5, 22 to 23, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So the husband is the head of the wife, uh, which does not mean that husbands are the monarchs at home. Uh, you know, while they are the head, they also have the responsibility and uh, First Peter chapter three uh, verse seven says, "Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel." Now, weaker vessel not meaning spiritually weak, but physically weak, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not 
be hindered. I'd like to read that again. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them. Dwell with them means with your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So God has made the husband as the head uh, in the authority structure in the house. Uh, he is the head. And as a head and the authority at home, it's his responsibility to have an understanding towards his wife. Not only to have an understanding towards his wife, he also has to give honor to his wife. Now, we usually give honor to those who are above us. But in God's kingdom, it works both ways. We give honor to those who are God has placed above us, placed those who he's placed in leadership, who is, he has placed as a, a head in the, in the government uh, uh, stru authority structure uh, in his government, in his uh, rule. Uh, and we also have to give honor to those who are below us. Okay, not only to those who are above us, but those who are below us as well. So here he says, you know, husbands honor your wives and husbands has to treat her well because at the end, both of them are co-equal. Okay, we saw, we saw that both husband and wife are, uh, uh, you know, man and woman are uh, co-equal. Uh, they are one before God. We are equal in the kingdom of God. We have equal access. Both man and woman have equal access to every blessing. We have equal access to every right. We have equal access to word of God. We have equal access to the authority that God has given us. But when it comes to God's government coming into the home, the husbands are in the position of leadership. They are the head and they must stand before God and before his family as king and priest, as a leader and as an intercessor, as a guide and as a uh, teacher. Basically, uh, the husband needs to position himself as a prophet, priest and a provider. Three Ps, prophet, priest and the provider. Prophet speaking the words of God, teaching, uh, speaking into the lives of the family, uh, speaking the spiritual into the natural uh, as, a, as a priest, you know, performing the priestly uh, responsibilities of uh, keeping the family or, uh, you know, uh, training the children in righteousness and holiness, praying and bringing in God's godly order, rule and reign, seeing that God's uh, uh, commandments, his laws is, uh, you know, is operating in the home and he's a provider. He has to uh, provide. So prophet, priest and provider. So the husband is the gateway of God's government into the home. The husband has the ability to place a spiritual covering of protection over his wife and the family as the head of the home. So if the husband does not fulfill his responsibility to her, his wife, um, or children, his wives will, his, sorry, his prayers will be hindered as we read in First Peter chapter uh, 3 verse 7. It says that your prayers may not be uh, hindered. Okay, so husband needs to correctly discharge his responsibilities given to him in God's authority structure. Um, you know, if he fails to do it, it will affect his uh, relationship uh, to his head, who is Christ. And it also affects the prayer life. And it actually, uh, you know, it uh, it hinders the blessing of God from just flowing in through the house. So it's very important for him to position himself. If he positions himself rightly as the prophet, as the priest, as a provider, you will just see God's, uh, uh, you know, anointing just flowing uh, uh, through. Uh, we read in, in the Psalms, it says, you know, uh, you know, in the, the oil flows from Haran's head, down his face, his beard, and right down. It's basically talking about oil, this anointing. The anointing flows right from the head, and it flows down. So when a husband positions himself right in, you know, honoring his wife, in um, understanding her, respecting her, and, um, you know, fulfilling his responsibilities as a king and priest, uh, as a leader, intercessor, guy, teacher, as a prophet, priest, provider, then, you know, he's actually bringing about God's government to his home. And uh, we see that, you know, that home will just experience um, 
uh, God's um, uh, favor, God's uh, supernatural blessing in abundance. Not that you know the the family will not have any challenges. You know, well, that's part and parcel of uh, the kingdom lifestyle as well. Uh, we already learned it, but the 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 blessings will. Uh, will super as exceed and people will see this is a home that is blessed uh, because you know we see the 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 man of the home the head of the home is correctly positioning himself uh, so similarly you know the wife also needs to rightly relate to the authority god has placed in the home and that is towards her husband so wives need to submit to their husbands and respect the husband as to the lord and um the wife need, yields to the husband, shows reverence and gives honor to her husband. And doing so, she is doing it unto Christ. Just like Christ willingly submitted to God's government. Even though he uh, is God himself, he is equal with God. But he, you know, he, uh, you know, stooped down to the position where he's, you know, he uh, willingly submitted himself to the Father's will and carried it out on the earth. In the same way, you know, a woman has to submit to her husband. And so when the woman also submits rightly, is in the right place, again, God's uh, blessings just flows through that. Um, oh. So if you see uh, a family is going through uh, a need or, a, you know, difficult situations, then uh, one of the things that we can look at is God's authority structure rightly being followed in this home. Is the husband doing his job as prophet, priest and provider? Is the wife correctly submitting to the husband? out of reverence to Christ, respecting her husband and ordering and honoring her uh, husband. But if there is a change in roles, in some families we see that the wives uh, uh, take up the leadership position, they become the head of the homes because the husband is lacking in his uh, responsibility of being the prophet, priest and a provider. And we see in such homes, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, there will be lack, there will be uh, things that they will suffer through or the challenges that they face, which they don't have to if the go if God's government is uh, rightly uh, being followed. And we saw, and I just said that, you know, if you follow God's government rightly, we understand it, we follow it, you know, it just uh, releases, uh, 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 God can exercise his influence and it also releases God's uh, blessing um, uh, in that home, in, in every member of that uh, family, okay? Um, you know, uh, if a wife fails to fulfill her responsibility in giving reverence and honor to a husband, uh, you know, uh, she's essentially failing uh, to do this for the Lord. And also, we see that, you know, uh, uh, to the children. You know, children, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 1, to three, can somebody read that, please? Ephesians chapter six, verses one to three. Ephesians six, verse one to three. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Thank you, Senatoli. So, what is God's government for children? Uh, children have to obey their parents and children have to honor their parents. Children have to honor their father and mother. Why do children have to obey their parents? Because it says the right thing to do. And why should they honor their parents? Because that brings blessing of a good life, uh, brings well-being and longevity. It brings about long life. Okay, um, there will be a time when, you know, children will uh, know more than their parents okay that's when when they graduate from college they get a degree uh you know there'll be a time when children will know more than their parents uh, in in various aspects of uh, life but uh, you know even in that situation uh we are to honor our parents even in that situation children have to honor their parents they need to treat them with respect um we need to give them the honor that they are uh, due we give them the reverence um, 
they might not know everything about uh, the kingdom of God or uh, what we are learning or the things of God. They might be ignorant, but we don't uh, look down on them. We give them the due respect, the due honor, the reverence. Uh, when we do that, you know, uh, we do it because God's government is coming into your home even as you uh, do that. When we do, uh, when we honor our parents, you know, we are receiving God's kingdom into our life, into our uh, family. So parents being in a position of authority as part of God's kingdom government coming to, into their home are in a place of responsibility actually to the serve disciple, uh, discipline, to train, to nurture children in the ways of the Lord and, uh, you know, without uh, hurting them or destroying them like we read in Ephesians chapter 6 verse uh, 4, okay? So it's time for, um, we're living in a time where uh, the hearts of the fathers will be turned towards their children and the hearts of children will be turned towards their father, which means that God is, uh, through his government, uh, uh, you know that he is uh, 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 ordaining in uh, in the homes. You know, God is bringing a restoration uh, of his uh, structure of government, his structure in the home, the families where uh, parents and children are able to relate to each other uh, in the love of God, the peace of God. And if this is not happening in a home, uh, then you know. Um, the word of God declares that there will be, uh, you know, there will be a curse that will come upon them as we read in Malachi chapter 4 verse 6, okay. Um, but when we follow the government structure that God has placed uh, in, his, in, our, in our homes, uh, rightly each member doing their responsibility, fulfilling their responsibility correctly, uh, both as parents and as children, then we become recipients of God's uh, blessing and the influence that he, uh, you know, intends to flow uh, in and through our lives, uh, through our home. Okay, so that's God's government coming uh, to us uh, through the family or through the home. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then um, we'll move on to God's um, government coming to us in the local church. Okay, so can uh, uh, one of you please read Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 30, please? Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30. Therefore, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, the shepherd, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, salvage wolves will come in, my, in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will raise up speaking perverse things, so draw away the disciples after themselves. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. Now, Paul is speaking to the elders at Ephesus, and he's saying that he wants them to watch over their own life because they are leaders, elders, uh, overseers of the people that God has entrusted to them. So he says, watch over your own life. And he's also saying, watch over the people that God has placed under them in the church. And he says, why? Because he says the Holy Spirit has made them as overseers of their lives. And, uh, uh, you know, also why do they have to, um, uh, you know, uh, why do they have to watch over the people is because, you know, these people are precious, very precious to God. And why are they very precious? Because they have been purchased by his own blood. So since they have been purchased by his own blood, says don't treat them lightly. Uh, 
You have to be leaders. You have to be on your guard. You have to do this for them because they are bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, you know, things can happen to the flock, to the sheep, to the people. They can be savage wolves that will come. Um, you know, these savage wolves, he's talking about people who will come, will bring about false teachings, wrong doctrines. But uh, as a leader, you know, God has given you the responsibility to guard them against uh, it. We need to watch over the flock uh, because God has put them responsible over these people. Now, this is God's um, government coming into the local church. So in the local church, God's government God's kingdom government flows through the local church pastor, through the spiritual leaders, and on to the congregation. So God's people must learn to relate rightly uh, towards their pastor and spiritual leaders uh, by, by submitting and giving honor to them. Okay, we'll stop here next week. We'll look at how a uh, pastor uh, being as, a, uh, you know, as the head in the in the local church what is his responsibilities how he needs to uh, bring in god's uh, kingdom government and how the elders and the congregation uh, must relate rightly uh, you know um, and how they must position themselves also to bring in god's kingdom government so together as a local church we can experience uh, the full intent of god's uh, influence and his blessing in the local church any questions anyone has No questions? Okay, thank you all for joining class. Sorry we started uh, pretty late today. Sorry for the inconvenience. Thank you. Have a blessed week ahead. I'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone.